Last Sunday, Jake and I were in Wiesbaden, Germany, and we went to worship at a Lutheran church, and the service was in German, and we didn't know the songs, and we didn't really know the language, and it is so good to be home and to worship in our mother tongue and to sing with people that we love and to be here. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the many ways that you have blessed us, not least, Lord, for the fact that you caused us to be born within earshot of the gospel. And Lord, we thank you and praise you that we can come and hear this good news and experience your mercy. Lord, I pray that you would cause us today to feel anew How kind you have been to us. How unmerited it is. How unlooked for. And Lord, I pray that you would cause what David prays in Psalm 143 to become part of the fabric of who we are. I pray that you would cause us to respond as he did. I pray that you would make us people who are like trees of life. That when those around us are suffering, we would be able to give fruit to them. Fruit that comes from your word. Lord, give us grace that we might communicate the great things that you have done. The great love that you have shown. And the enormity of the mercy that flows from your deepest heart. God, I pray that you would overwhelm us with who you are. Mark us by the knowledge of you. Make us your people. And do it, we pray, through your word, by the power of the Spirit. Cause Christ to reign as the word is preached. We pray in his name. Amen. I would invite you to open this morning to Psalm 143. And as you turn there, I would just put into your mind that we have an enemy that Peter says prowls around like a roaring lion. And I would invite you to reflect on what this enemy did at the very beginning of all things. He sought to turn those who were innocent and pure into twisted and defiled rebels. I'm talking about Adam and Eve and all of their descendants. This enemy would cause a garden of life to be polluted and cursed, judged, and left as nothing but a smoking ruin. And Satan wants to ruin our lives. He wants to wreck our marriages. He wants to ravage our children. He wants to sow division throughout this congregation. He wants to turn anything good he can into evil. He hates us. And and I would invite you to think about the enormity of that hatred, the ferocity of that hatred, as we turn to Psalm 143 this morning. As we approach this psalm, I want to propose to you a way of understanding this last set of Psalms of David that we have in the book of Psalms. So you may have noticed that Psalms 138 through 145 all have a Psalm of David in their superscription. And then there is no superscription on 146 through 150 and uh, prior to 138, 137 has no superscription and then uh, same with 36 and 35, and then we had those songs of ascent that we looked at together. So there's a unit here, I think, of Davidic Psalms, 138 through 145. And I think that there's a a, a structure to this unit, and and I'm just going to give you my conclusion, and you can be a Berean, and you can go test it for yourself. So the central one of these Psalms, it seems to me, is 141. So, and that leaves a balanced number on either side of, of 141. And I think the central idea of 141 is what David says in verses 5 and 6, where he says, let a righteous man strike me. 
and, and this is in contrast with 140 and 142 where he's talking about the traps of the wicked. Okay, so you've got, you've got a welcoming of righteous rebuke in the middle. And I would just observe here that, again, I think I said this when we went through Psalm 141, but I think a characteristic of those who have been born again is that they feel Psalm 141 verses 5 and 6. Let a righteous man strike me. It's a kindness. If you've got my good at heart, and if, you're, if your perspective is informed by the Scriptures, and you're motivated by a love for God and love for neighbor, confront me. If you're, if you're born again, you welcome that kind of confrontation. In contrast to that, 140 and 142 both have these traps and snares of the wicked. And then prior to 140, in 139, you have David's reflections on the character of God. It's, it's sort of like implications of who God is, and he's thinking through what, what God implies about his whole life. God knows him behind and before, and he knew all of his days before one of them came to be, and he searched him and known him fully. And that would mean that 143 stands across from 139 in this balanced structure flowing out from 141. And, and I think that there are a number of points of contact with uh, between Psalms 139 and 143. And, and what this does for us is it enables us to, to allow the truths of Psalm 139 to fill in the details of Psalm 143. So I just want to draw your attention to some of these things. So look, for instance, at 143.3. At the end of the verse, David says, He has made me sit in darkness. He's talking about the enemy, like those long dead. Remember 139, 11, and 12. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day. And then look at 143, verse 5. I meditate on all that you have done. I ponder the work of your hands. Look at 139, 16. Um, I, I'm sorry, that's not the verse I want. I want 14, sorry. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. And then all through that section there, David is talking about the works of God in creation and in redemption. And that's, I think, what he's pondering here in 143. And then look at 143.8. Let me hear in the morning of your steadfast love. 139 verse 18. I awake and I am still with you. So he awakes in the morning and he wants the steadfast love of the Lord. There are a couple of more similarities. 143.10. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. 139.24. Lead me in the way everlasting. And then finally... Uh, 139, uh, 19, for instance, oh, that you would slay the wicked. And then verse 22, I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. 143, 12, in your steadfast love, you will cut off my enemies and you will destroy all the adversaries of my soul. So the very, very similar Psalms here in 139 and 143. And again, the, my, my purpose in pointing this out is that I think whoever arranged the Psalms, I think it probably started with David and then was maybe developed by uh, those who came after David and maybe put in some Psalms that were written later uh, than, than David's life. Whoever put this together meant for us to, to see, in, as we read Psalm 143, these connections with Psalm 139. So as we, as we go through this Psalm, we're going to find that the the psalm comes in two verse units. And, um, and I think that David has this enemy in mind as he cries out to the Lord. I think he feels desperate. He feels needy. And, and to a certain degree, he's suffering. He's suffering as a result of the ravages of the enemy. And in the biblical worldview, the worldview that grows out of the Bible, ultimately, all of our pains... All of our pains stem from the sin that Satan induced the man to commit. So, so in, in, in our worldview, we explain all the wrongs in the world as going back to that original sin brought into the world as a result of satanic temptation. And, and I think that David is in many ways responding to that here in Psalm 143, which informs him persisting in prayer. 
Look at verse 1. Hear my prayer, O Lord. And I would invite you to consider how many times we've read those words as we've gone through the Psalms. Over and over and over. I haven't counted how many times it happens, but the, the words, hear my prayer, happen over and over and over through these 150 Psalms. You know what that tells us, among other things? I think it tells us that David persevered in prayer. David didn't just pray once and then, hey, I, I prayed that prayer, I'm good. He kept at it. It also tells us that David's difficulties didn't necessarily go away. And, and I mean, sometimes I hear this, this kind of thought from people. I've tried that. I prayed. I cried out to the Lord. It didn't get better. Well, David's response to that seems to be, I'm going to persist in prayer. The, the world hasn't changed. God hasn't changed. God's not going to alter his purposes. The only question is when. When is God going to make things better? And, and if we believe that the world is what the Bible says it is, if God is who the Bible presents him to be, then I think we ought to respond the way that David does. I'm going to persist in praying to him. I'm going to continue to cry out to him. I'm going to believe that he has the power and the goodness to change things. The only question is when, and between now and then, I'm going to be found faithful, faithful to continue in prayer. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my pleas for mercy. So he's just continuing to say these things. And then he says, at the end of verse 1, in your faithfulness, answer me. God's faithfulness is the idea that he can be counted upon. It's the idea that if he says, I'm going to be there at a certain time, he's going to be there at a certain time. He's not going to stand you up. It's the idea that if, that if he says, these are the boundaries, these are the standards, these are the rules, they're going to stay that way. He's not going to alter them. He's not going to change the goalpost or, or move the finish line on you. He's faithful. And just to reiterate this, I think, David says, in your righteousness. So he's got faithfulness, emunah, righteousness, tzedakah. This is who God is. This is the very character of God. He is faithful and he is righteous. And God said, David says, in your faithfulness and in your righteousness, I'm asking you to deliver me. And verse 2, I submit to you, presents to us a superficial contradiction. And I hope you feel the contradiction. I want you to feel the contradiction because I want you to experience the resolution of the tension between these verses. So look at verse 2. Enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. Superficial contradiction. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 15. Listen to these words. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. You see the contradiction I'm getting at? David is saying, in your faithfulness, deliver me. In your righteousness, but don't bring me into judgment because no one living is righteous before you. And, and I think if, if you don't know the Lord, if you're in the place of Proverbs 28, verse 5, this is what Proverbs 28, verse 5 says, evil men do not understand justice, but those who seek the Lord understand it completely. If you're an evil man, this is, I think, how you're going to respond to what David says. Oh, I see. The righteousness, faithfulness of God is supposed to be applied to your enemies, but not to you. Because you're saying you're not righteous. You're asking for mercy. And so you want the righteous... You're a hypocrite is what you are. You are a contradictory hypocrite. Because you want righteousness for thee, but not for me. What's going on with that? What's going on with it is the fact that David knows... God has made provision for sin through the old covenant sacrificial system. David understands that the Lord delights to forgive those who turn from their sin and trust in what he's provided. So under the old covenant, again and again as you read through the book of Leviticus, 
You, you, you read statements like, when they come to know their sin and they realize their guilt and then they come and they offer the sacrifice, the priest will make atonement for them. And that's where we find David. David is a man who knows his sin. He, look at the end of verse 2. No one living is righteous before you. He, he knows he's not righteous. And he also knows that God has provided substitutionary sacrifice so that, so that God is able to be righteous even as he shows mercy. God is able to forgive and deliver in righteousness. This is what Paul is saying in Romans 3 when he says that, that because of the passing over of former sins, God put Christ forward as a sacrifice of propitiation. This is, this is the gospel, is what this is. This is the gospel. David understands what Psalm 85 verse 10 says, that the Lord has caused righteousness and peace, shalom, to kiss each other. David understands Psalm 103 verses 10 through 12. He does not deal with us according to our sins. Why not? Because we've repented, because provision has been made to satisfy God's justice. David understands Psalm 32, verse 1. Blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven. So if you're at a place where you resonate with Proverbs 28, verse 5, and you think, no, that's not right, we're inviting you to come into Proverbs 28, verse 13 which says, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Stop looking at the way that other people have sinned and experienced God's forgiveness and enter into that forgiveness for yourself. Receive it. You're not righteous either. No one living is righteous before God. Psalm 143 verse 2 says. Now, as we... As we move out of these first two verses, before we go from them, let me draw your attention to the way that David is talking about God's character. He's talked about God's faithfulness, God's righteousness, and then the way that he identifies himself in verse 2 as God's servant. Now look down at the last two verses of this psalm, verses 11 and 12. For your name's sake, O Lord. Randall prayed, Exodus 34, 6 and 7, earlier in the service, where the Lord proclaims his name, and then he defines his character, and he uses a lot of these words. Words like uh, steadfast love, look at verse 12, in your steadfast love. In verse 11, we see righteousness. And then look at the end of verse 12, I am your servant. So here's what I would, what I would suggest to you as a, a sort of uh, heading for verses 1 and 2 and verses 11 and 12. The Lord's servant knows the Lord's character. David is calling himself the Lord's servant, and in in Verses 1 and 2 and verses 11 and 12, he calls himself the Lord's servant. And in both verses, he outlines God's character. The Lord's servant knows the Lord's character. That's the kind of people we want to be. We want to be people who know the Lord's heart. He's a God who is righteous, but a God who forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. Look at verses 3 and 4. For the enemy has pursued my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me sit in darkness like those long dead. There, this is, David is describing an enemy, a satanic opponent who is pursuing him, persecuting him, crushing his life to the ground. Why is he describing it that way? I, I think he's describing it that way because... Um, the Lord made man from the dust of the earth. And then he said, in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. And then when man ate of it, he said, dust you are and to dust you shall return. And what did the enemy do? The enemy entered into the garden and tried to cause humanity, man and woman, to bring that death sentence down upon their own heads. And that's the imagery that's employed here. The enemy has pursued my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me sit in darkness like those long dead. And it's overwhelming for David. Verse 4, therefore my spirit faints within me. My heart within me is appalled. What he's saying is I've had enough. 
My spirit faints within me. I can't go on. I can't take this anymore. David is being honest with himself and with God. He's not hiding his feelings from the Lord. He's not hiding how he's doing from other people. You know, sometimes people look really strong on the outside. And they look like they're doing great. And then later, later we come to find out they were really suffering. And, and that's, that's a hard, that's a hard, I mean, what are we supposed to do? You looked like you were doing great. How was I supposed to know? So what I'm, what I'm trying to communicate here is we want to be people who can be honest before God and honest with one another. We want to be people who can be open with each other about how we're really doing. We want to be people who can press past the superficialities so that we can help one another. So verses 3 and 4, David is describing his own fainting spirit and, and the, the, the singular enemy, the enemy. Look down at verses 9 and 10. These uh, verses 11 and 12 balance 1 and 2. Verses 9 and 10 balance 3 and 4. Look at verse 9. Deliver me from my enemies, plural, O Lord. I have fled to you for refuge. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. David says in verse 4, my spirit is fainting. He says in verse 10, let your spirit lead me. I, th I think these are balancing concepts. And so I would say that we should follow David's example. When we've had enough, we should cry out to the Lord to lead us by his good spirit, which is so much more powerful and so much more consistent than we ourselves could ever be. Verse 5. What does David do in response to the soul-crushing darkness the enemy brings against him in verse 3? He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me sit in darkness. What does he do? Look at verse 5. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you have done. I ponder the work of your hands. What does he do? He keeps doing what he's been doing in the whole book of the Psalms. He puts his mind on God. Anything else that you put your mind on. You can put your mind on fantasies about how you might succeed in life and have lots of wealth and power and influence. You can put your mind about, on fantasies about pleasures that you might be able to experience. You can put your mind on lots of things. And you know what you're going to find? At the end of all your ruminations and fantasizing, you're empty and you got nothing. You got nothing but the reality in which you must live. The only thing that's going to help you to put your mind on is the Lord. We should follow David's example. He puts his mind on God, specifically on God's work. And note how he says here, I remember, I meditate, and I ponder. David is describing a deep, slow, musing, thinking through. It's like he's chewing up the fruit in his own mouth. And, and he's describing a way of, of concentrating. I, I think that when you, when you set your mind on an idea, whether it's God or creation or the cross, when you set your mind on that idea and you focus on it and you gaze at it steadily and you just stay there, you, you can enter into this meditative state. And what begins to happen is you begin to see the contours of everything that went into what it is that you're thinking about. And you begin to explore the implications of the character of God and the power of God. You begin to think about what he can obviously do. And what that does is it begins to reorder your soul in light of these truths. And what that does is it begins to form your heart. And you become a person who knows the living God. 
I don't know anything that's better than any of, better for any of us than meditating on Scripture. I, I don't think I could tell you something that would be more healthy for you spiritually, emotionally, intellectually. There is, there is nothing better for yourself than you can do, that you can do than meditating on the Scriptures. When David says here in verse 5, I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you have done. What comes to mind? I think what immediately comes to mind is creation. And then, and then in, in thinking about creation, you remember back in Psalm 139, verse 16, David had said in, in the middle of the verse, in your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. So before creation started, God had a plan. So, so David is contemplating God's activity from before the foundation of the world, at the foundation of the world, and in the mighty deeds of redemption that God has performed for his people since he made the world. God planned the world. God built the world. And God has consistently, throughout history, delivered his people in the world. Do you know what? what I mean, just one implication of this. The world cannot but become what God intends it to be. God planned it. God built it. God is accomplishing. He is going to accomplish his purposes. It will happen. But as David acknowledges in verse 6, this doesn't automatically fix everything, does it? Look at verse 6. David says, I stretch out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. There's two descriptions here. And both of these descriptions communicate how David is yearning for God. The idea that he's spreading out his hands to the Lord, this is a universal, universally recognizable act of supplication. This imagery suggests that David has empty, open hands, lifted to receive the deliverance that the Lord alone can bring. So he knows the truth. He's meditating on the truth, and he still needs God. He still needs God. Second, look at how he describes himself. My soul, my soul thirsts for you like a parched land. You can think of a, a desert, the scorching sun, and this weary, infertile ground. No fruit trees growing there. No, no flocks pasturing there because there's no water. And David is saying, I need God like that land needs rain. The Selah at the end of the verse, at the end of verse six, I think stands at the very center of this verse. It's like, it's like David wants you to stop for a moment and ponder what, what you've seen. And then he begins to respond in verses seven and eight. And I think again, verses seven and eight, I think are, are connected to verses five and six. And look what he says, answer me quickly, O Lord. Again, I think the point here is, Lord, I know you're going to act. I know you're good. I know you're powerful. I know you're wise. And I need you to be fast here. I need you to come to my aid. Hasten, you could translate this. Answer me quickly. My spirit fails. I've almost had enough here. I'm not sure I can go on. So David doesn't give up. He doesn't conclude that God has changed. He recognizes that God is going to do what he has said he will do when the time is right. But notice that David also doesn't just sort of passively resign himself. Well, I guess I'm just going to have to sit here and suffer. No, he's actively laying hold of the Lord. Appealing to Yahweh. And look at what he goes on to say in verse 7. Hide not your face from me. I, what David says here calls to my mind what he had said in 139, 11 and 12. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. Don't hide your face from me. If your face is shining on me, even as a desert land, 
waiting for the, the renewing reign of the resurrection from the dead and the new heavens and new earth and the final defeat of evil, even as I wait for that, if you will turn your face toward me, I can endure. If you'll be with me, Lord, I can make it through this. Hide not your face from me. And then he goes on to say in verse 7, lest I be like those who go down to the pit. If I don't have your presence in the midst of this difficulty, I'm not going to make it. Verse 8, let me hear in the morning your steadfast love, for in you I trust. Make me to know the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. David knows. Jill and I were discussing this passage, and she reminded me of Psalm 34, verse 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. David knows that this is the kind of God the God of the Bible is. And, and David knows that if the Lord tarries, he could be exhausted. He'll lack the gladness of beholding God's face. And so what he wants in the midst of this difficulty is the Lord. Look at the end of this verse 8 there. For to you I lift up my soul. I would invite you to ask yourself the question, what keeps me from lifting up my soul to the Lord? What is David getting at when he says he lifts up his soul to the Lord? I think it communicates the idea that David is saying, I'm going to make myself an offering to you. It's almost like an anticipation of Romans, Romans 12, 1, right? Living sacrifice. I'm going to lift my soul up to you. What does that mean? I think it means he's giving God everything that he is. He's committing himself to following God's commands, to living for God's causes, to hoping in God's goodness. What keeps you from lifting your soul to the Lord? Is there some private pet sin that you don't want to let go of? You don't want to lift your soul up to the Lord because you want to hang on to this destructive sin in your life. Is there some refusal to confess? You know it's wrong. You're trying to beat it. But you don't want to tell anybody about it. Is there some prayer request that you've been persistently lifting to the Lord and it hasn't been answered and so it's caused you to stop lifting up your soul to the Lord is there some unfulfilled desire you want something so bad and the Lord hasn't granted that to you and so you you're hesitant to lift your soul up to him maybe you're here today and you're dealing with an addiction that is keeping you from giving yourself to the Lord. Probably, for most of us, we would say, no, there's not an addiction and none of that other stuff, but there's a lot of distraction in my life. There, 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 there's all this stuff that occupies my mind and my time, and it keeps me from having time to be still before the Lord to fix my eye on some, my, my mind, my brain on some biblical truth and to come to a place in my meditation and my prayer where I'm lifting my soul up to the Lord. Maybe you're overwhelmed by your duties and your responsibilities. We need to recognize that this is what we live for. We live for God. We live to know God. God. And, and we need to take stock of our lives and we need to figure out ways to say, if it's distractions, I'm, I've got to put that stuff away. If it's duties, I've got to carve out, carve out time. There's got to be somewhere where I can fit this in. And if it's these other things, some form of sin in your life, I would just urge you to deal with it. You've got to deal with it. You, you, you need to confess to some people. You need to get some people around you and, and say to them, this is what I'm dealing with, and I can't overcome it by myself, and I need you guys to walk with me because I want to know God. I want to be somebody that's lifting up my soul to the Lord. We're, we're about to conclude this service, and we're going to dismiss uh, um, visitors. 
And, and yet, um, you visitors, I want you to know that there are going to be some elders available in the foyer out back and in the lobby that if you want to talk to somebody about dealing with some of these things in your life, they're going to be there available for you. And, and this members meeting that we're going to have after the service is not going to last that long. So if you want to hang around and talk to me afterwards, we're going to be here. We'll be back here at 430 for a picnic. So come, come talk to one of us. But don't continue in despair in slavery to sin, don't, don't let your life go off the rails. Don't let the enemy destroy you. Verses 9 and 10, uh, David knows that these enemies, they stand against the Lord and they stand against him. And so he, he's crying out again, deliver me from my enemies, O Lord. I have fled to you for refuge. He not only wants to be delivered from their power, he wants to be delivered from their practices and from their attitudes and from their philosophies. And that's why he says in verse 10, teach me to do your will, for you are my God. When God teaches us, we want to do what he commands. When God is our teacher, he alters us in such a way that we want to live to please him. That's what David is crying out for, which is encouraging because it tells us that David didn't always feel that. I don't always feel that. I bet you don't always feel that. We're in good co- We're all sinners. We're all twisted up inside. We all need to pray this prayer. Teach me to do your will and do it in such a way that I want to do your will. Let your good spirit at the end of verse 10 lead me on level ground. Verse 11, for your name's sake, O Lord, preserve my life. David knows that the Lord's name and reputation are at stake in what happens in his life. And look at the way that David continues in this theme of God's name. Again, Exodus 34, 6 and 7, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, abounding in steadfast love and truth. Look at verse 11. In your righteousness, bring me my soul out of trouble. And in your steadfast love, you will cut off my enemies. So he's just developing the idea of God's name. Preserve my life in these ways. Bring me out of trouble. Cut off my enemies. You could almost say something like God's glory and salvation through judgment there, couldn't you? Verse 12, you will destroy all the adversaries of my soul, for I am your servant. God is going to act in righteousness. God is going to uphold his own standard. He's going to vindicate his people. He's going to forgive their sins. And he's going to destroy their enemies. He will accomplish this salvation. And what David prays for himself here, it it, it finds its fulfillment in the Lord Jesus, doesn't it? The enemies of David, they find their fulfillment in the enemies of Jesus. And the people that made war on Jesus, the kind of people that made war on Jesus, they're making war on the people of Jesus. You can think of that scene in Revelation 12 where the dragon is trying to devour the male child of the woman. And he's caught up to God in heaven. And so the dragon goes off to make war on the woman and the rest of her seed. The seed of the serpent trying to devour the seed of the woman. And so we who follow Jesus, we pray Psalm 143 in union with Jesus, following the example of of, of David, an example that Christ fulfilled. And God preserved David's life, and God raised Christ from the dead, and God will preserve his people, and we will, by God's grace, accomplish everything the Lord sets for us to do. And when Christ returns, he will raise his people that they might reign with him. Let's pray together. Father, we want to be those who lift up our souls to you. And so, Lord, we pray for your help as we, as we deal with our sins, as we confess our sins to one another, as we set in place new strategies and practices and try to build new habits that will make it so that we have time to remember, and to meditate, and to ponder you and all you've done. Lord, we pray that you would conform us to the image of Christ. 
We pray that you would make us like him, a man who often withdrew to lonely places and prayed, a man who communed with you. And Lord, we pray that you would cause his joy to be in us, that we might be one with Christ by faith, and that his spirit might dwell in our hearts, and that we might bear fruit as his disciples. Amen.